This week we're going to talk about machine learning teams. So why why do we talk about machine learning teams as part of this course? Like, what does this have to do with uh, with building working machine learning systems? Um, well, I think one of the challenges with machine learning is that you know running any technical team is hard. Um, it's hard to hire good people. It's hard to manage teams of people and develop them into better versions of themselves. It's hard to um, manage the output of your team and make sure that all of your your vectors are pointing in the same direction and you're producing the output that you want the team to produce. It's hard to make good long-term technical choices. It's hard to manage technical debt. And it can al often also be difficult to manage expectations from leadership. And this is true for any technical team that you might work on. But machine learning adds quite a bit of complexity to this. Machine learning talent tends to be expensive and scarce. There's a diverse set of team uh, of roles rather that need to be present in order to make machine learning work. The projects that you work on are often going to have pretty unclear timelines and a high degree of uncertainty to them. So managing output can be even more difficult. The machine learning field itself moves really fast and is, uh, to quote the famous, the now famous Google paper, the high interest credit card of technical debt. So. The, the process of making sure that you are making good long-term technical choices and avoiding debt is even more challenging. And then when you're managing expectations from leadership, in many organizations, leadership doesn't actually really understand AI and how it's different from regular software. And so this can make your, your job as a manager even more challenging. Um, and so for, the, for those of you that are uh, looking at this and thinking, well, I'm not managing people, so how is this relevant to me? Well, hopefully, um, this will give you some insight into how you know maybe your manager is thinking about building and managing t machine learning teams. And also a lot of the advice here is tailored towards kind of helping you get a job in the machine learning world. And so that's kind of what I hope that you take away from this. What are we gonna talk about? So first we'll cover the different roles that exist in machine learning organizations and what are the different skills that are required for each of those roles. Then we'll talk about machine learning as in the context of the broader organization. Um, then we'll talk about some management best practices for how managing machine learning teams looks different from managing regular software teams. And then we'll talk about hiring. So how a lot of machine learning teams think about or maybe should think about hiring ML engineers and how to also get hired if that's your goal. So starting with roles, um, here is a list of some of the common machine learning roles that we see out there. Um, machine learning product manager, DevOps, data engineer, ML engineer, ML researcher, data scientist. Right. So there's um, there's a lot of different roles that are involved in the process of building machine learning models. So one question you might ask is, what's the difference between all these different things? How do they work together to build a machine learning enabled product? So starting with ML product manager, this person is sort of responsible for working with the machine learning team to help prioritize and execute on, on uh, projects. And one way that you can think about the, the work that these different roles do is, you know, what, are, what is the output that these roles are typically measured by? And so for product managers, it's things like design docs and wireframes and work plans. DevOps and engineers are the engineers that are responsible for deploying and monitoring production systems. And so their work product, like the, the thing that they're measured, that they're measured on is the final deployed machine learning system. Data engineers are responsible for building the data pipelines, the aggregation, the storing, and the monitoring of the data that goes into creating your machine learning systems. They're building distributed systems, essentially. And getting more into the ML specific roles, ML engineers are, you know, the, the way we define it, the folks that are typically responsible for training and deploying the prediction models themselves. And so their work product is the prediction system itself. Um, running on real data in production. And so these are these folks are like working with TensorFlow, but they're also working with tools like Docker to actually productionize the machine learning systems that they're creating. There's another role that exists in some organizations that I would call a machine learning researcher. And so these are folks that are also training prediction models, but those prediction models are either kind of more forward-looking, more speculative, less production critical, or they're working really closely with an ML engineer or another en engineer to productionize them. And, um, and so these folks are producing 
a model and sort of a report that is used to describe that model. Um, how well does this model do? What is it useful for and things like that? And so the distinction is that um, ML researchers typically are not deploying models themselves. And then lastly, there's this role called data scientist, which is kind of a catch all term used in this field. So it's, it's used to, it, I've seen it um, being used to describe any of the roles listed above. And in some orgs, this is actually something totally different from the machine learning process. So in some organizations, data scientists are more really more like business analysts. They're, they're you know, running SQL queries to produce dashboards to help answer business critical questions. And so when you see the term data scientist, it's important to dive in a little bit and understand in a little bit more detail what that actually means in the organization that you're, you're talking to. Here's a, um, here's a breakdown of kind of how we think about some of the different skills that might be needed for all of these different roles. So on the left axis is kind of how much software engineering skill you need. Um, on the right, on the, the bottom axis is how much kind of skill and experience you need in machine learning. And the size of the bubble is the, the bar for um, technical writing and communication. So how well you're able to communicate the ideas that you come up with, with other people. And there's a spectrum of the different degrees of these two skills that are needed in these roles. So starting from, um, starting from the top left with really, really high software engineering skill and actually not necessarily any knowledge of machine learning at all, maybe beyond the basics, are these ML DevOps folks. And so these um, people who are in these ML DevOps roles typically come from um, traditional software engineering pipelines, traditional software engineering roles. And this role really is more software engineering um, with a little bit of knowledge of ML baked in because those are the, the customers that you'll be working with. Data engineers, um, also require a lot of software engineering skill, um, but they, they also are starting to need some knowledge of, of the basics of machine learning as well, um, because the machine learning team is kind of a very active customer of the pipelines that you're building. Machine learning engineers are kind of right in the middle, requiring actually a ton of, of um, skill and experience in machine learning, but also really solid software engineering fundamentals. And so this is, this is a pretty rare mix. And these folks can come from different types of backgrounds. It's often software engineers, people who've worked in software engineering for some number of years who have done quite a bit of self-teaching um, in, you know, uh, in the field of ML. But it's also sometimes people who are you know, science or engineering PhD dropouts or have some more uh, machine learning focused background who then went into a software engineering role and trained in that discipline for a few years. And these are kind of the, the unicorns of the uh, machine learning hiring landscape. These folks are very hard to come by and um, typically command uh, significant premiums on the job market these days. Machine learning re researchers, these are your ML experts, right? So these are the folks that, you know, if anyone on this list tend to have um, some higher degree, uh, a master's or a PhD in CS or stats, or in some cases, they did one of these industrial fellowship programs like the Google Brain Residency or, or something like that. Um, not all ML researchers have that characteristic. Some folks you know, just uh, did undergrad and went right into the field, but I would say those are the more common types of background for that role. Data scientists, again, since this is kind of a catch-all uh, role, catch-all term, these folks come from a really wide range of different backgrounds. You see folks that are in data science who, you know, maybe did an undergrad program that specializes in data science. And then you also, on the other side of the spectrum, you see folks who have, you know, hard science PhDs, uh, physics PhDs and things like that, who have transitioned to this kind of role. And then lastly, the, this MLPM role, this is kind of an emerging role. So there's not really a, a typical kind of path to this role right now, but it's often people who come from a traditional PM experience but you know who for whatever reason have gotten a lot of exposure to the ml process um, you also see a lot of times folks who came from the ml world realized that they didn't want to actually stay in um in like kind of core technological development and transition into pm later in their careers any questions on the the different roles in the machine learning um, typical machine learning development life cycle 
startups that I've seen um, be really successful at this kind of thing uh, tend to index more on these roles in the middle that do multiple things. So ML engineers, um, you know, folks that can that know enough ML to build machine learning models, but also are solid engineers. Those that tend this tends to be like overrepresented in startups from what I've seen, because um, it's kind of a generalist role. Um, I don't see many startups that have ML PMs or, um, and then ML researchers are present in startups, but mostly in startups that are really doing like pretty hardcore, you know, machine learning first uh, type of companies. So like in self-driving car startups or other robotic startups. Um, DevOps, I think, is a pretty uncommon role in startups because, you know, DevOps tends to be a, a role that um, becomes more critical as the complexity of your product and your engineering team increase. So I think that one's still pretty uncommon. And then data engineering, I think, is uh, also something that at least startups should invest in. I'm not sure how many of them actually do, but maybe that's that's uh, that's if, you know, if, if I were uh, building a startup that w was building a, a product that has machine learning in it, Data engineering is one of the first things I think is worth investing in. All right, so we talked about the different roles that go into machine learning organizations. Next thing that we're gonna talk about is how machine learning teams themselves are situated in the context of the lar larger organization that they're part of. So um, I went out and had kind of a bunch of conversations with folks about this to understand where um, where their machine learning teams are situated in their org and how they kind of interact with the rest of the organization. The overall lessons learned here are that there isn't really a, a consensus yet as to what is the right way to structure a machine learning team. Um, different organizations have different practices and different kind of structures seem to work well for different types of organizations. And so the goal of this section is really to help, um, is really to just like provide kind of a taxonomy of um, best practices for at different like maturity levels of organizations based on what we've seen. So the metaphor that we're going to use is um, scaling the machine learning organization mountain. So starting starting from the bottom, the bottom of the mountain, um, we have organizations that have kind of nascent machine learning, or maybe they're doing machine learning in some ad hoc way. So what does this look like for your organization? Really, this means like no one's doing ML or there's a couple of people in the in the organization that are doing an ML in some ad hoc basis. You probably have very little machine learning expertise in house. Um, what kind of organizations fit this bill right now? Well, if you look outside of like Silicon Valley tech companies and Fortune 500 companies, most companies are in this category. Like most kind of small to medium businesses, um, even ones that do have software teams in house, uh, and especially ones in less technology forward um, uh, industries tend to be doing very, very little machine learning right now. Maybe there's a couple people in the org that are experimenting with it. Um, you know, hard to find advantages of a model like this if you're trying to do ML, but one of the big advantages if you're looking to join an organization at this stage is that there's probably low hanging fruit. There's probably things that you can go in and do and just have a big impact. The big disadvantage of joining an organization at this stage, if you want to do ML in the context of the organization, is that there's often very little support for machine learning projects. The organization itself might not really believe in machine learning. They might not feel like there's a mandate to be doing complicated things like machine learning. Um, and so you might be fighting an uphill battle in terms of like convincing people that what you're doing is worth the time it's taking, worth the money that it's taking, and um, actually a good idea. And then, if your goal is to kind of build out a, a function in this organization to use machine learning to do good things in this organization, it can be really difficult to hire and re retain good talent because um, in machine learning, like in many other technical fields, a lot of, you know, many really talented people want to work with other really talented people. And so you can go and work in an organization like this and be the talent magnet, but um, it's, it's going to be, you're going to, um, you're going to be fighting against the, um, the kind of natural tendency of people to want to go where other machine learning people are. Climbing up the machine learning organization mountain to the next stage, um, kind of the next stage of uh, that many organizations adopt machine learning at is what I would call like the ML R&D archetype. So what does this look like? Um, this is kind of the stage at which 
the company is, you know, decided that it's curious about machine learning. It's starting to do some research and development um, around it. It has some POCs and, um, you know, it's starting to invest in it in maybe a more exploratory way to figure out, okay, is this, does this really make sense for our business? And in many of these organizations, the machine learning effort is centralized into um, a smaller team that's maybe off somewhere in the research and development arm of the organization. And in a lot of cases, what this actually corresponds to in terms of the outputs of these teams are, since they're not really closely embedded with product teams, they're really operating more like researchers. They're kind of getting data sets from other parts of the organization, they're running experiments on them, and they're producing internal reports or maybe external papers that are essentially you know, um, proof of concept that maybe one of these models could be useful in the company. So I've seen this a lot in some of the larger um, industries that are slower tech adopters. So oil and gas companies, manufacturing companies, telecom companies that maybe have an ML uh, research group somewhere, but are not actually doing ML at scale yet. There's a couple of advantages to this model. One is that you can often hire pretty experienced researchers into an organization like this, because since the, the mandate of this like ML R&D team is to do research and not to necessarily build actual products, that tends to appeal to researchers who wanna keep doing the kind of thing that they've been doing. And the other big advantage of this I think is pretty underrated is that you can, you, you know, since these teams are not really being held accountable for near term output, let's say, they often have the mandate to work on longer term business priorities and things that could be bigger wins if they actually work out. But the disadvantage is that people that work in organizations or machine learning teams that have the structure site are, a big one tends to be that it can be really difficult to get data from the rest of the organization, right? So if, you're, if you have to go out um, into other parts of the organization and ask them for data um, that you need in order to solve the problems that you're solving, in many cases, those, there's not a lot of buy-in from those other parts of the organization that they really need to help you. And so getting data even internally can be difficult for these teams. And then another big disadvantage is that, you know, if, if the goal, if your goal is to produce, you know, products or business innovations that have machine learning in them, then this model just doesn't really work very well. So these efforts from what I've seen rarely actually translate into, into real business value. And so usually what that means is that the, the amount of investment in these organizations remains pretty small, um, unless through some heroic effort of the team, they manage to push something out into the world that, um, that causes the, the organization to believe that this is really something that can make their products better now. Moving up the, the mountain from the ML R&D archetype, the next um, archetype that is pretty common is having, having machine learning folks that are dedicated to doing machine learning, but not actually having a centralized machine learning team. So this, what this looks like is you'll have machine learning oriented um, individuals who are embedded into different parts of the business or different product lines. Um, and maybe these are only certain product teams or maybe it's most of the product teams. And, the, um, and th this model really, the thing that excels about this model is that you put your ML expertise alongside the software um, and analytics talent in the organization. Um, the ML folks on the team typically will report up to the same engineering lead or tech lead that the rest of the, the software team in the organization reports up to. A lot of um, smaller or medium sized or like even high growth, like software technology startups fit this, um, you know, choose this model when they're first starting to adopt machine learning. And it's pretty common in particular in financial services companies and fintech companies. There's a couple of big advantages to this model. So I think the biggest one, and the reason why a lot of startups in particular choose this is that the, when the machine learning folks that you have in the organization make improvements, it's very likely that those improvements are gonna to lead to real business value, right? Because those folks are sitting with a team that's building a real product. And so they're, the problems that they're choosing are inspired by the needs of that team. And they have the, the support of the engineering organization around them to actually get those improvements into production. Um, and there's, in particular, there's a tight feedback cycle between an idea that the machine learning um, practitioner has and actual product improvements. And so you can really see the impact of your work if you take a role 
in an organization that's structured like this. But there's a few disadvantages to this model as well, which is why I think it's not where um, most companies end up in the long term if they invest really heavily in machine learning. So one thing is that um, kind of just like in the nascent machine learning organizations, it can be hard to hire and develop really, really top tier talent in an organization like this. And I think the core reason to that is that um, you as a as a like data scientist or a machine learning person in an organization like this, you're a little bit off in an island. So you're you're kind of um, you're not really working with people that are are practicing the same craft as you, at least not super directly. Um, and so that can be that can be challenging for folks that want to surround themselves with people who are really good at their um, their their craft and to learn try to learn quickly from them. Access to resources can lag. So in a lot of organizations, if you're a data scientist reporting up to the product team, it might be hard to get tons of compute resources or things like that because your budget is going to be coming out of the budget for that product team. And um, I think maybe the 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 um, largest disadvantages to working at, to at working as a machine learning person in an organization like this is that machine learning project cycles tend to operate a little bit differently than software pro, uh, product cycles. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but you know, the core difference is that when you try something in machine learning, you know, most of the time it doesn't work, right? So machine learning projects tend to come with a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty. And that can be difficult. Um, that can be difficult to fit into engineering um, sprints and engineering planning cycles. And in particular, longer term machine learning projects, things that might take, that might be very uncertain and take six months or a year can be very difficult to justify in a structure like this. So that's, I think, one, one thing to be aware of if, you're, if you are considering jumping into a role like this. Um, the next higher stage on the machine learning organization mountain is the, an independent machine learning function. And so what does this look like? This is a centralized machine learning organization just like exists in the ML R&D archetype, but it's um, where it's situated in the organization is very different. So the, the ML division of the company might report up to senior leadership, um, in some cases, maybe even the CEO of the company. Um, this, these types of organizations might have ML PMs. Um, they might have ML researchers and ML engineers that are working with internal customers to build out machine learning enabled products to help um, those internal customers make, you know, either make their processes better or maybe the products that they're producing better. These teams often are also engaged in longer term research, whether it's internal facing or actually writing papers. And, um, oh, you know, the types of organizations that tend to have this type of structure are like large financial services companies, big banks, for example. Um, and also like many of the larger, uh, larger tech companies outside of, you know, Google and Facebook and Uber and places that are really well known for machine learning like that, um, like a Salesforce type organization. The big advantages of this model and the reason why many organizations choose it is because you're creating this sort of um, the center of excellence around machine learning. So you have a really high talent density, which means that you can hire really good people who want to work with other machine learning folks and train them um, because you're surrounded by other people who are doing the same thing. The advantage of structuring the organization like this, as opposed to having it be part of the R&D function, is that, you know, typically it reports up to a pretty high level of senior leadership. And so that means that um, a lot of the problems of data availability, you can you can kind of bust through because, you know, if you're if your machine learning organization reports to the CTO or something like that, then the CTO can help you um, get data if that's what you're having trouble with. And then lastly, in in the kind of machine learning in, embedded in product functions archetype, um, one thing that often lags is um, is like centralized tooling and centralized infrastructure for the ML team. But organizations that fit this archetype can invest a lot in making sure that they have a great machine learning platform and a culture around deploying machine learning models. The disadvantages of an archetype like this are that um, you, since the, the folks that are doing the machine learning are not embedded into the product teams themselves, they have to hand off the models at some point to the, to the folks that are actually gonna be using them in their products. And that can be challenging. So, you need buy-in from the users, and you also need them to have some level of kind of baseline knowledge about what is this thing that they're using so that they can uh, make good decisions about when to, you know, when it's working and when it's not working. 
And because of that, um, feedback cycles can be pretty slow. All right, so we've reached the top of the machine learning organization mountain. And uh, the I, I think kind of the, the standard that most organizations should eventually try to build to as their machine learning function gets more mature, which is the, the archetype of machine learning first organization. So what does this look like? Um, it's like really strong buy-in that machine learning is important uh, across the organization. And you have both a machine learning division of the company that is working on challenging long-term projects like infrastructure, um, research, and higher risk projects within the context of the business. But then you also have ML expertise within every line of the business, um, every product team that are focusing on quick wins and are working with that central ML division to make sure that there's machine learning being deployed into the products that they're working on. So there's a few examples of companies that are um, fit this archetype or are close to this archetype. And they tend to be you know, your large tech companies, your, your Google, Facebook, Uber type companies. Um, and then also some of some really machine learning oriented startups. The big advantages of this are you have great access, access to data um, because you have folks that are thinking about uh, things from a sort of a, a, a data and machine learning first perspective scattered throughout the organization. But you also have central resources to collect that data and push through organizational silos. Um, it's really great for recruiting because you have this centralized ML team that works on the hardest machine learning problems in the organization. You have lots of resources and lots of real business problems to solve. And deployment is easiest in this model. So your product teams have some understanding of machine learning baked into them, but you also have a team that's able to invest in the infrastructure that it takes to deploy stuff well. Disadvantages of this model, um, really the disadvantages are practical disadvantages. It's just hard to do this. So it's hard to implement this structure well, it's hard to recruit enough talent, and um, it's culturally difficult to make sure that everyone in the organization um, has the base level of understanding that they of machine learning that they need to make this work. So a few kind of design choices that are, uh, that, um, that machine learning organizations need to make as they're figuring out how to set up their team structure. So one is balancing software engineering and research. So, you know, to what extent is the machine learning team itself responsible for building and integrating with software versus like, you know, shipping models off to some other team. Um, and related to that, like when you're, when these teams are hiring people, how important is it for them to get software engineering skills on the team versus focusing on getting people that are good at machine learning and good at data. Data ownership, um, how much control does the machine learning team have over data collection, um, data warehousing, data labeling, and data pipelining um, versus being you know, a customer of some other team that's solving those problems? Model ownership, um, is the machine learning team the ones that are deploying the models into production or do they hand them off to some other team to do that? And who maintains the deployed models when they're in production? Um, so different organizations um, make different choices uh, for these different design choices, depending on like which stage of uh, what where they are in the mountain. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through the details here, but um, kind of as you'd imagine, um, as you get further and further to the right on the, on, on the mountain, things get more and more specialized and the machine learning team gets, um, gets more and more control over the data and the models that they're producing. All right, I'm gonna move on and talk about managing machine learning teams. So there's, I think, as I alluded to earlier, there's a core challenge in managing machine learning teams that makes it uh, more difficult in some ways than managing traditional software teams. And that core challenge is that it's often really hard to tell in advance how easy or hard something in machine learning is going to be. Um, so this is a uh, set of charts from a blog post by um, Lucas Bewald, the Weights and Biases founder. And this is from a Kaggle competition that he ran where they were, um, and this is plotting the, the accuracy of the best, um, the best submission over the course of the competition. So in the, in the first couple of weeks, this is what the accuracy over time looked like. So things are improving really, really fast, right? And so it's like 
this is great. You know, we've hit, we've gone from 35 to 70% accuracy in like a week. So, um, you know, we're going to crush this. We're going to crush this benchmark. We're going to hit like 99% accuracy and solve this problem, right? Um, if you extend this graph throughout the entire competition, this is what it looks like, right? So essentially, you know, there was a huge improvement in that first week and then very, very marginal improvement um, thereafter. And that's not due to lack of effort. This is, if you can plot that against the number of teams that are participating in the competition, which is going up really steadily over the course of the competition. And so the, the upshot of this is that, you know, um, you might read this chart on the left and infer like, okay, ba based on past improvements, we think we can improve our model by this over the course of the competition. But making those types of judgments in ML is really, really challenging. It's very, very difficult to know how difficult or hard or something is and whether, you know, early signs of progress are really indicative that the problem is going to be easy um, or whether, you know, the easy gains were easy and the hard gains are going to be hard. Um, and so uh, in addition to being difficult to tell how hard something is, the progress, the like kind of pace of progress for machine learning teams tends to be very nonlinear. Um, so it's very common in, in my experience for machine learning projects to entirely stall for weeks or for weeks or even longer, right? Where there's no kind of measurable improvement in performance over, over that time period. And um, in the early stages of the project, it can be really difficult to plan because it's unclear what's gonna work, right? You might have a dozen ideas of different models to try, different ways of augmenting your data, different ways of collecting more data, um, new architectures that you're dreaming up, but it's very, very hard to know in advance um, whether any of those or which subset of them will be successful. And so as a, as a result of these two things, Planning um, project timelines is, in particular, is extremely difficult. And so one way to think of this is that, you know, even production machine learning is still somewhere between what, you know, how most of us think of research and what we would think of as like a true engineering discipline. On top of that, there's, um, you know, in, in the real world, machine learning teams at some level, if you're going to build production systems, need to interface with engineering teams, software engineering teams. But there's often cult big cultural gaps between these two fields. So they have you know, different values, backgrounds, goals, and norms. Um, and in more toxic cultures, what this can lead to is these two sides really not valuing one another, right? Like you'll have um, a setup where you know, software engineers think of machine learning researchers as these like divas who don't even know how to code. And machine learning researchers think of software engineers as these like, um, you know, these like plumbers who don't have, you know, who can't have a creative idea to save their, save their lives. And in reality, neither of those, like for in healthy organizations, these teams collaborate really closely with each other and have a high degree of respect for one another. Um, but the, the different, the different cultural norms in the fields can be a, um, be a blocker to that. Another big challenging, a challenging thing for managing machine learning teams is that in many organizations, leaders just don't really understand machine learning. Um, so they, you know, they, they may not know like what's actually feasible. They may not know how, and they may not understand this, like the fact that things are just going to take longer or at the very least, the timelines are going to be more uncertain around machine learning projects. So the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer to how to um, get rid of all of these problems. I think managing machine learning teams is a genuinely difficult and unsolved problem. But I want to give a couple of insights that I've learned um, uh, from folks that are really good at this about how to manage machine learning teams better. The first is to do, um, instead of doing kind of traditional waterfall based project planning to instead do project planning for your machine learning projects probabilistically. So this is what your um, kind of like task chart might look like for a traditional software project. You have all these tasks and they may be feed into one final task and you can plan out how long each of them take and how they um, pipeline into one another. In the machine learning world, um, like conceptually, one way to think about project planning is that you should also be assigning success probabilities to each of the tasks. Um, so, you know, task A might, you might, you might say like, uh, that's only 50% likely. And then in order to do task D, which is maybe the thing that we care about, it depends on these two tasks, each of which is maybe only, um, or maybe let's say it depends on at least one of task B or task C. 
um, but each of them are only you know 25 or 50 percent likely to succeed and so we're going to do both in parallel um, and then what this might look like over the course of the project is well we work on task b um, and task c for a week we realize hey task c is really not working at all like let's call this failed um, and task c actually seems pretty promising like this this model architecture that we picked seems like it's going to work but it's going to take longer than we thought so We'll spend the second week on task um, task A or task B rather, um, and then we'll extend our timeline for task D. Um, and then over time, you know, as you get a sense for which projects are going to be successful or not, as your beliefs about the likelihood of success of each project of each project um, evolve, you can then think in the future about which other projects depend on those projects and adjust your plan based on that. And so. Um, Really what this means is that you have, what you want to have is a portfolio of approaches. So um, the, the corollary of, uh, of, of doing machine learning project planning probabilistically is that you shouldn't have any um, path critical research projects, right? So if you, if you need to, um, if you need to like have an answer to this one question in order to move forward, then you shouldn't, you know, in, in a perfect world, you shouldn't just have one idea about how to do that. You should be working on a couple of different things in parallel. Um, you don't need to do them in parallel, but um, you could try them sequentially. Like let's say if you only have one person that's working on them, but um, many good organizations do. They have kind of a norm where, hey, we, ha we, have, to, like, we have to improve this model by X percent. And so we're gonna have um, two researchers try five different ideas. And the one that looks the best after two weeks is the one that we're gonna go with. Um, so kind of like a, a friendly competition of ideas. Um, and you know, coming back to the cultural norms around managing machine learning teams, well, this can be a, a very difficult thing to get right culturally because when you have you know different people on the team having their ideas compete with one another, that can um, that can lead to negative cultural consequences if you don't build the culture of the team the right way. Another another upshot of this is that it's when you're measuring the success of the team, um, it's really important to do this uh, based on inputs rather than based on success. Um, so what that means is that, you know, when you're doing performance management, when you're deciding like who on the team is doing well, who on the team is not doing well, it's really important not to get hung up on whose ideas worked and whose ideas didn't work. In the long term, it is really important for people to do things that work. Um, but on any given project, the success measure is how well you executed on the things that you tried, not necessarily whether the things that you tried ended up being successful or not. Right, since we're taking this portfolio of, of projects approach. Um, another kind of thing that I've seen be really important for organizations that do this well is having researchers and engineers working pretty closely together. Um, one common failure mode for a lot of organizations is thinking that either engineering is more important than research, which often leads to kind of getting stuck on the machine learning side or the opposite, right? Thinking research is more important than engineering, which t tends to lead to like really elegant solutions to problems maybe that no one has or uh, solutions that can't be productionized. Another best practice for making this work well is trying to get something end-to-end -end working relatively quickly. Um, this does a couple things for you. First, it makes it just makes the task more likely to be successful since you already have like a version of it that um, does almost what you want. But it also allows you to communicate your progress to leadership better, right? Because if you have um, if you have a basic prototype of your thing working that's maybe only like 50% accurate when you need it to be 80% accurate, then you can go report to leadership of like, oh, this week we went from 50% to 60%. This week we went from, you know, and next week we're going to try to go from 60% to 65%. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a clear way to communicate the progress because you can actually um, have, have clear metrics and have something clear to show people. Um, and then the last kind of best practice I would cite here is at trying to educate the leadership of your organization on this phenomenon, right? This phenomenon of machine learning timeline uncertainty. Um, unfortunately, there's, you know, as, as like machine learning engineers, in many cases, there's not a whole lot we can really do here to, to change people's minds about this. Um, a lot of the onus, onus here is on leadership, like to actually build their own realistic understanding of the way that these things work. But I think that there's like machine learning teams themselves bear some responsibility for this as well. Um, so, uh, you know, just to give you an example, what is a what is a bad like kind of weekly status update to leadership 
sound like. Um, so an example of a bad weekly status update to leadership might be like, hey, leadership, um, you know, this week we did great. We improved our cat detection model from 60% to 80% accuracy. You know, we have lots of ideas for how to continue to improve from here. Next week, we're going to try making our model bigger and we hope to improve accuracy even further. Right. So that's kind of, that's kind of like um, over optimistic, like hype building um, style of communication that focuses on the things that the machine learning team cares about and is working on, not what's actually leading to making the, the system, the overall system that you're trying to create better. Um, it doesn't communicate the risks and it doesn't communicate the uncertainty that you have around timelines going forward. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Next thing I want to point to is um, if you if you are in this position where, you know, someone higher up in the organization doesn't understand the way that machine learning works and um, and the way that it's different from building software, there's a couple of resources that you can point them to. Um, there's this this kind of older blog post from Andreessen Horowitz, or I think it's like actually a talk that's a very high level overview of AI, um, which is pretty out of date at this point, but still one of the best intro level, like executive level materials that I've seen. And then um, Peter taught an AI strategy class uh, in the business school at Berkeley, what I guess maybe a year ago at this point. Um, and so that's also worth pointing people to. All right. Last topic that we want to cover is hiring. So both, we're going to look at this from both perspectives, right? From the perspective of someone maybe who's trying to hire ML engineers, maybe, um, you know, in a, in a couple of years, you have a, your own ML startup and you're looking to hire ML engineers, but also from the perspective of um, someone who's trying to get hired as an ML engineer. We're going to talk about a few things here. Um, first is the AI talent gap. And so this is just important for setting the scene about what um, hiring in the machine learning world is like right now. Um, so you might ask yourself, like, you know, what are the supply and demand dynamics of this market, right? How many people are there out there that know how to build AI systems? Um, different ways of estimating this. There's a couple from Element AI, you know, 5,000 actively publishing research. That's probably too narrow. Um, 10,000 with the right skill set. Um, Bloomberg estimated that there's 22,000 PhD educated AI researchers. Um, Element AI gave an upper bound of 90,000 uh, people based on the methodology that they used. Um, and Tencent also had a number that they thought was around 200 or 300,000, which is the number of like AI researchers and practitioners. Um, and so you might think like, oh, this is actually kind of a lot. But if you compare this to the number of software developers, even just in the US, which is 3.6 million roughly, um, or around 18 million in the whole world, there's really not that many folks that are that are out there in the world doing machine learning right now. Um, and so the, the sources here are all listed in, in this blog post. I think these numbers are probably a couple years out of date at this point, but hopefully still give a, a rough indication of, of um, the talent gap. And so what this has produced is a fierce competition for AI talent. Um, this is a quote from, a, uh, from Bloomberg. You know, everyone agrees that the competition to hire people is intense. Um, academic conferences are becoming frenzied meat markets. Um, seven figure salaries for top researchers, you know, it's crazy out there. Um, this is a quote from a computer vision engineer at a later stage startup that we interviewed. Hiring is crazy right now. This is a young field. It got popular very quickly. There's a ton of demand, not a lot of supply. Um, uh, from another startup founder, it's really, really challenging to hire from ML. It takes way more time and effort than we expected. Um, we have someone working on it full time and we're still only able to get a few people per quarter. So that's just setting the stage for, you know, the difficulty that that companies are having tr hiring ML engineers right now. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is how um, how folks should think about sourcing talent for machine learning teams, folks that are in a hiring position. Again, we, we looked at a number of different common machine learning roles. Um, uh, I think for some of these roles, like for ML product manager, DevOps, and data engineer, it requires maybe a slightly different mindset um, than hiring for you know the more software, like traditional software version of these roles, but not really that different. Like you might want to look for some interest in ML, some study of ML, um, but fundamentally not too different. Um, and so for the purposes of 
this lecture are going to focus on the more core ML roles, the ML engineer and ML researcher type roles. So there's a there's a um, there's maybe not like a right way to do this, but there's certainly a wrong way to do it. Um, so this is a this is like maybe a caricature of a job description, but uh, maybe not too far off from like what a, what are, what some actual machine learning job descriptions feel like, um, which is you know duties of this unicorn ML engineer. Um, keep up with the state of the art. You have to you have to be able to implement models from scratch. You need to have you know deep understanding of mathematics. You need to be able to come up with new models on your own. You need to be able to build all the tooling and infrastructure for the machine learning team yourself. Um, you need to build data pipelines as well. You need to be able to also you know deploy and monitor all the models that you're creating in production. And you know so what you really need in order to be successful in this role is of course you need a PhD. Um, definitely need at least you know four years of TensorFlow experience. Um, uh, and like at least four years as a software engineer as well, right? Um, oh, and by the way, like if you don't have at least a couple of publications in NeurIPS or ICML, then probably not fit for this role either. Um, so this is obviously like this is this is obviously taking this idea of needing people who are good software engineers and good ML um, and have good ML skill sets too far. Um, but this is, I think, like how a lot of companies are really trying to hire ML engineers right now. Um, so what's the right way to do this? Well, again, I'm not sure there is a single right way, but um, I think one thing that, that more companies should think about is hiring for um, a, a couple of different paths, right? So one is primarily hire for software engineering skills and maybe some experience in ML and a desire to learn and train folks to do ML. Um, another thing that you, that companies should do more of is go more junior, right? Like these days, most, most folks are graduating from Berkeley um, with some ML experience. So... Um, more junior folks are more likely to have this kind of background. Um, and then the core thing that I recommend teams to do is to be more specific about what you really need, right? Like not every ML engineer that you hire needs to have all the skill sets on the previous page. Um, if you're hiring for ML research positions, there's a couple of specific recommendations here. Um, one is to look for more for quality of publications rather than quantity. Um, and this requires like having some taste for what you consider a high quality publication to be. Um, but it's things like originality of the ideas, the quality of the execution of the paper. Um, other thing I recommend is look for researchers who work on problems that you think are actually important, right? Um, a lot of researchers tend to focus on problems that are trendy uh, at the, the moment that they're doing their research without really thinking about why the problems that they're working on matter. And that is the kind of research that won't translate super well to a, to a um, company environment. Oftentimes, folks that are that excel outside of academia are researchers that have worked before outside of academia. So that's another thing to look for. And um, a couple of other like alternative paths to consider are folks who are really talented in um, adjacent fields like physics or statistics, or people you know without PhDs, right, from non-traditional academic backgrounds. People who are really talented undergrad or master students with some research experience, or folks who have been in one of the industrial fellowship programs. How should, um, how should folks think about like sourcing ML engineer and ML research candidates? Um, you have your standard sources. Um, you can also keep an eye on top conferences and, and archive and flag first author papers that you like. Uh, at OpenAI, some of the hiring committees would basically just go through all the ICML papers and flag the ones that they thought were interesting and reach out to the first authors. Um, another source other than just papers is looking for good re-implementations of papers. Um, so if you if there's a paper that you're interested in and you find a reimplementation that is good, that you know whoever reimplemented that paper could be a good hire. Um, a lot of this recruiting, you know, in the when in-person conferences happen again, a lot of this recruiting happens at ML research conferences. Um, so that that's another good place to go look for people to hire or go look for a job. So, you know, next question you might have is like if you're if you know if when you're running your startup and you're um, maybe you find some really some really talented machine learning research, machine learning engineering candidates, how do you actually convince them to join? Like what are folks um, in those types of positions looking for? Um, so I, I think like there's no real generalization here. Different people want to join companies for different reasons, but there's a few common things that I've seen from uh, folks that fit this profile. So working with cutting edge tools and techniques, you know, latest papers, the latest infrastructure systems, 
um, building skills and knowledge in an exciting field. So really being able to learn a lot about, um, about a fast growing area of machine learning, working with excellent people, um, working on interesting data sets. So um, one of the unique things that you can offer as a company is, is the data that the folks will be working with. And then um, lastly, and maybe most importantly, doing work that actually matters. And so how do you translate this to, you know, to the pitch that you, that you give to people that are thinking about joining? Well, um, for folks that want to work with cutting edge tools and techniques, you as a company um, can work on research oriented projects. And uh, when you do that, really highlight those things. So publicize them, maybe write papers about them or blog posts, um, invest in the tooling that your team is using, um, empower people to try new tools and um, really create, a, create the kind of environment where people are actually working on cutting edge stuff. For, for candidates that are excited about building skills and knowledge in an exciting field, um, there's one thing that some organizations do really well is building a team culture, especially on the machine learning team that is oriented around learning. Um, so Peter talked about reading groups um, in, in his lecture last week. Um, another, other ways to do this are learning days, so specific days that you have set out for focus to for people to focus on learning new things, uh, having a professional development budget, a conference budget, just really investing in people to make sure that they're staying up to date. Working with excellent people, one way to make your company stand out on this axis is just to have, you know, at least one or two people working there that are relatively high profile. Um, now, that's maybe easier said than done because you need to convince the high profile people to join. But the other way to, to kind of bootstrap that if you don't have that is to help your best people build their profile. And the way to do that is to um, help them publish blog posts and papers so that they get their name out there. Um, for if you have an interesting data set to work with, something that's unique, something that is um, maybe has interesting technical properties, then you can sell the, the properties of the data set in the recruiting process. And then lastly, you know, just like recruiting for any position, selling the, the mission of the company and the potential um, in particular for impact of machine learning on the company's mission can be really helpful in, in closing folks that uh, to, to work on this kind of stuff. All right, um, next let's talk about interviewing. Um, so uh, I think like some of the things that you'll see folks test in machine learning interviews, um, if you're going through some of these interviews are, you know, um, trying to help assess whether you can think creatively about new machine learning uh, problems, um, testing generalist software engineering skills. Um, and I, I think in many organizations, that's true both for researchers and for software engineers uh, who are slotting into ML roles. Um, and so the, the degree to which those things will be tested will differ depending on the role, um, but I would expect to be tested on both your knowledge of ML and your ability to do software engineering if you're going into an industrial role. What actually happens in ML interviews? So the ML interviewing process is much less well-defined than the software engineering interview process. So there isn't really a book that you can go and buy that will help you prepare for machine learning interviews in the same way that there is for software en in, uh, engineering interviews. But there's a few kind of types of assessments that I've seen to be pretty common. There's you know your traditional background and culture fit. Um, there are there's you know an analogies of typical software engineering interviews like whiteboard coding or pair coding. Um, one thing that's I've seen be unique to machine learning uh, interview processes is pair debugging. So looking at some machine learning code that has a bug in it and working with your interviewer to find that bug. Um, math puzzles, like say involving linear algebra are pretty common. Take home projects are pretty common. Um, what I would call like an applied ML assessment. So explaining, you know, interviewer articulates a problem that you need to solve. You explain how you'd use machine learning to solve it. Um, probing into past projects that you've worked on. So if you have a, a past machine learning project that, um, that you can talk to, maybe it's the project for this course, being able to kind of go deep on what are the different choices that you made, what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then machine learning theory questions. So explaining things like the bias variance trade-off to your interviewer. Last thing I want to cover is finding a machine learning job. So if, if, you're, um, if you want to get, get a job as a machine learning engineer, um, where should you look? So again, there's your standard sources, your LinkedIn, your recruiters, your on-campus recruiting. Um, but if you want to go beyond that, then looking at the machine learning research conferences can be a really good way to do it. 
there's often tons of recruiting that happens in those places. Um, and then this is maybe bad general advice for getting jobs, um, but in the machine learning world in particular, um, you can uh, often just apply directly for companies. You know, because there's a talent shortage, a lot of companies are really just trying to look wherever they can find for talented machine learning folks. And so they're more open to direct reach out in many cases than um, in the traditional software engineering world. Um, how to stand out. So if you are applying for these jobs, what are things that you can do to make your background more impressive? Um, so having basic software engineering skills, you know, working at, at a Stripe or a Google, like a well-known software engineering company is, is really good. Um, having some interest in machine learning is also really important. Um, if you can, if you can demonstrate that knowledge, so writing blog posts that synthesize a research area or writing blog posts that, you know, um, explain a new research topic that's emerging or a new category of models that is emerging, uh, can demonstrate that you have like a good grasp of the overall field. And that can be really impressive to, to people that are doing hiring. Um, but even better than that is demonstrating the ability to get machine learning projects done. So if you have side projects or paper re-implementations that you could point to, that's often a way to get over the hurdle of this person doesn't have that much experience. So how do we know that they're going to be able to get stuff done? And then, especially if you tend more to the research oriented side, um, then proving you proving that you can think creatively in machine learning. So you know, winning Kaggle competitions, publishing papers, and things like that can really make you stand out. Um, in terms of how to prepare for machine learning interviews, again, maybe this will be relatively obvious given the you know what we talked about being in these interviews. But one thing I would emphasize here is that you, sh in addition to preparing like machine learning specific stuff, like re reviewing ML theory, um, thinking about how basic ML algorithms work, like re reviewing your 189 materials, I would also recommend preparing for a generalist software engineering interview um, because many companies do test machine learning engineers for basic software engineering skills as well. All right, so to, to wrap up here, um, since we're, we're gonna move over to the, to the panel, um, we talked about roles, organizations, managing machine learning teams and hiring. Um, there's a couple of takeaways from each of these here. Uh, in, in terms of roles, there's many, many different skills that are involved in making production machine learning work. And so the, the thing I would want you to take away there is there's a lot of different ways to contribute. And so you should think about that, that chart of different roles and how they plot to skills on, the, on different axes. Um, and you know, just know that there's like, you can, you can max out on software engineering, you can max out it on ML, or you can have some, some balance of the two and still find a lot of ways to contribute to machine learning projects. Um, and, uh, and, and lastly, I would say, you know, in, in, terms, of, in terms of hiring, um, it can be difficult to break into the machine learning world as an outsider. Um, and so that the, maybe the main kind of takeaway that I would, I would give you there is like one of the best ways to do it is to use projects as, as your way in. So um, hopefully the project that you create as part of this course you know, if you don't have a portfolio of projects already, it can be the first step toward doing that if you do want to go get a job in this field. All right, and that's all that we have for today. Um, thanks a lot, everybody.